quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. It's where we all begin. Welcome to Lazy Dog Typewriter. movie. Indiana Jones explores the jungles of South America searching for ancient treasure. When he finds it, it is booby-trapped and he barely escapes. At Lazy Dog Typewriters, we have had our own adventures seeking treasure from South America in the form of the Italian-branded, Brazilian-made, and Swiss-designed Laterra 82. Based on the highly regarded Hermes baby, Alterra 82 was manufactured by Olivetti in Brazil using machinery purchased from Hermes. This makes the Hermes baby and its sequels, the Rocket and the Alterra 82, one of the longest running typewriter models ever. Is the sequel better than the movie? Let's find out. Howdy folks, as Kevin noted, we've been looking for treasure in the jungles of South America, and we have found the Laterra 82. As we noted, in many ways the Laterra 82 is the sequel, or the sequel to the sequel, of the original movie starring the Hermes Baby. Originally manufactured in Switzerland, this, the Hermes Baby enjoyed one of the longest runs of any typewriter manufactured anywhere, uh, evolving into the Hermes Rocket, uh, and then ultimately into the Olivetti Laterra 82, which, as Kevin mentioned, is an Italian-branded, Brazilian-made, and Swiss-designed typewriter. It's the epitome, really, of the cosmopolitan or international typewriter, and in many ways it uh, shows what happens as our world globalizes. We have things designed in uh, places like Switzerland, and then manufactured where there's lower costs in places like Brazil. So, without further ado, let's get started. One of the first things you'll notice about this, of course, is the green color. That is a plastic body instead of the metal body, which is on the Hermes Baby and Rocket. We have our Olivetti do Brazil SA and our Brazilian keyboard. So let's take a quick look at what it means to have Brazilian Portuguese, more accurately, uh, Brazilian Portuguese keyboard. So, one of the first things you'll notice, of course, is uh, the symbols that are Brazilian, and I honestly don't know what this one is, so that's one we shouldn't probably start with. But we do have a series of diacritics in Brazilian. So we have a grave and an acute. We have a, what we commonly call a bearded C, which is called a circumflex. And we have, or actually, excuse me, the bearded C is the uh, sedia. I'm sure you all knew that. And then the circumflex is the upward pointing arrow, and that's above a tilde. One of the things we learned when we were researching this uh, particular key set is that Brazilian Portuguese um, differed from Portuguese Portuguese. And it wasn't until 2016 that something called the Reformed Orthography, which was agreed to in 1990, uh, was put into place and it simplified some of the extra characters that uh, were used, like the umlaut or what it was called, was removed from Brazilian and all global Portuguese. So there has been some evolution to the language and not just the typewriters that reflect that. So that's kind of one of the fun things you learn when you're learning about typewriters. Continuing the theme of adventure and <laughs> sequels, you may notice we have Harrison Ford gracing the upper right cover of our uh, Laterra 82 and that's because uh, we couldn't find Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, so we replaced him with Harrison Ford as Han Solo. So hopefully you'll bear with us and won't whip us too much. So here is the original version of the movie. This is a 1946 Hermes baby. And in many ways, it's dramatically different uh, than the Olivetti Laterra 82. But what is on the inside is what is most similar to the Laterra 82 because that's uh, because the... Uh, Brazilians took the manufacturing machinery from Switzerland and also uh, West Germany and moved it to Brazil. So the internals of the machine are somewhat simplified but are the same. And in some ways, if you really wanted to, you could try to remove the internals of this 
machine and put it in vice versa and you probably have a pretty good fit. I think you can even make it work and we'll maybe touch on that a little bit later. I'm not sure you'd want to do that but to a Hermes baby but here we go. So you see some nice features in this uh, typewriter. You've got some gull wing ribbon covers that aren't uh, exactly there anymore but you can sort of see the vestigial remains of the gull wing covers on the Lotera 82 and of course you have your uh, pop-up paper support. Interestingly enough, in our particular example of this Lotera 82, and we have two, one of which is a parts machine now, um, this model doesn't have a pop-up. And I think maybe they reduce that feature, remove that feature to, uh, Kevin's not a fan, but to remove that feature in order to save costs, or maybe our just particular model uh, didn't have that, which kind of brings me up to an, uh, a cautionary tale in reviews. One of the things to watch out for when you only have one example of a typewriter is thinking well this one example represents all of this particular model most of the times it's pretty close but sometimes i think reviewers can get a particularly bad example of a typewriter and really hate them uh, without giving them a fair shot and not casting any stones but robert messenger is a gentleman who put the Lotera 82 on one of his top five lists of all time worst typewriters. And our experience certainly doesn't uh, reflect that experience. Um, and we'll get to that later when we type our typing test. But it's just interesting, you, as a reviewer, you gotta try to have a little bit more perspective, I think, or at least a broader sample size. But uh, without much further ado, we'll continue on. So, just to look at the two, they both are very similar. They're very flat machines, as you can tell. They're ultra portables. Very similar, the Lotera 82, um, and I'll slide this back next to it if we can get both in frame, is the same height. Now you have a much larger, and some would say improved, carriage return arm on the Lotera 82. The uh, Hermes baby has just a tiny little vestigial one, almost like a Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, sized <laughs> carriage return arm. And uh, let's talk about another comparison. Uh, that's the keyboard, and Kevin's going to point out some differences we see. These keys are fully circular and made of hard plastic, possibly baked light. And what else are they? What do they look like, Kevin? And they're black, and some are gray, and the gray ones resemble this, but the black ones, not at all. And over here on the Lotera 82, what do we have here, Kevin? We have a sort of light grayish stuff, and... It it doesn't really resemble the um, grayish green, but it's kind of it's kind of going there. Okay, so yeah, there's definitely a distinct touch that you have. You have a much older, more traditional uh, touch on the Hermes baby over here, with the way the uh, kind of a curved, concave keycaps, and over on the Latera 82, it's definitely a lighter weight uh, key se selection. I happen to have a. Uh, uh, late model Olivetti standard that has exactly the same keycap, so I guess we have a source of key donors if we needed them. Um, the touch is important um, on the rocket is much crisper. It feels crisper. Uh, it's something that was lost a little bit in the uh, translation into Portuguese. But if you have compared it to, if you have tried a Smith Corona um, Corsair model, I would rate the typing action of this particular Lotera 82 as higher than the Corsair, and I find the Corsair to be serviceable, but not distinguished in its ability to, uh, to type. Something you would use for short notes or stationary, but I would not want to write a novel with a Corsair, and I would not want to write a novel with a Lotera 82. But it is totally serviceable, at least in our example. A quick synopsis of the basic features of the Lotera. So we have our backspace, on this uh, button here, we have our margin release indicated here with the dual arrows. Our shift, of course, caps lock. What we have here is our ribbon color selector. Instead of the normal red, white, or black, we have a one, zero, and two for uh, upper position, I believe, stencil position, and then uh, lower position of the ribbon. We have an all black ribbon in, so it's kind of a moot point at the moment. Um, we have our carriage release lever here, and we have our uh, margin set, very traditional, looks like Nakajima actually, um, for our margin columns. Uh, we have a paper bale and a raised paper raised table. And as I mentioned, right about here where you see these notches cut in is where the uh, paper support would normally be. And on my other parts machine, there is a peg upon which a paper bale or, or paper support uh, lever will pop up. But this one has no paper um, support 
um, there's nothing to which to it you can attach it. I was going to swap it over from our parts machine, but there's just nothing there. So I'm not sure if that was a cost-cutting measure or if this is just another example of a, a strange one-off that we have. What you can, <clears throat> can kind of see as I move this over, try to zoom in for you, is <clears throat> the cracking we have going on here. So our particular model cracked right in the center. And you can also see some more flaws. We have cracking in this back panel. It just sheared off. And I think that's pretty much... Uh, and we have it over here on this side as well. It's not quite as, as severe, but you can see it uh, here. I, th I don't know if any of these machines have survived uncracked. And that is a uh, reflection on their manufacturing quality and the design. I don't know what these little strange little pieces are. They grasp onto the body frame pieces, but there's obviously a lot of stress placed right here. And they ended up just shearing off. To give you a look at the Frankenstein look of a bottom of our plate, you can see the crack running right down the middle. We've repaired that with epoxy, and hopefully that will make it last for another 20 or 30 years, but it's certainly not the best thing to look at. <clears throat> now, comparing that to a Hermes is an unfair comparison because here we have beautiful crinkle coat, you have a solid piece of metal, maybe just sheet metal, but it's been formed if not stamped, and obviously much, much more rugged and dependable, but it's also a fair bit heavier. On the pro side, the Latera 32 is definitely lightweight. Excuse me, Latera 82. It's at least 50 better than the Latera 32. Uh, it's very lightweight. It's portable. It's flat. It's uh, in the league of the Skyrider um, and the Royal Light, uh, but and probably more closely akin to the Corsair is what I would compare it to. All right, now for a typing test. The Quick Brown Fox jumps over a lazy dog. So... Again, Robert Messenger, who knows a lot more about typewriters than I do, had an example of the Latera 82 that he absolutely hated. Um, but I don't hate this one. And I've got a decent taste in typewriters. So I look and I see our example of our output, other than lack of a space there, is very crisp and clear. Uh, let's try that again. Longs in a museum. It's not the age, it's the mileage. Any other uh, Indiana Jones quotes you guys can think of? That pretty much covers it right off the top. So um, the ribbon's a little bit light in this example, and I think that may be due to our example not advancing the ribbon uh, as smoothly as it should, but that's uh, a one-off example. In other words, we still have a pretty nice crisp output. Um, it looks good, and it's not bad to type on. One thing I wanted to show you guys, because it's not all that common, is how the special characters work. If you've heard of a dead key, many of the special characters have dead keys. But let's go through the, the first, the uh, regular ones first. So we have the bearded C, Sadi, I believe it's called, and it works like a normal key. It has a little beard. Uh, and then we have the diacritic marks. So when you press them, we'll shift. When you press the key, it doesn't move the carriage. So the way you would do that is you would press the K that you want, you'd make the diacritic mark, let's say this one, and then you put the character that goes underneath. And I'm not a Portuguese speaker, but uh, this would be how you would put your different symbols on things. Again, all these special characters, um, kind of like the, the tilde and other things in Spanish, uh, are dead keys. So when you strike them, the carriage doesn't advance, and that's kind of a neat a neat feature, and hopefully we're able to see some of that as we typed it. I'll give you a kind of a messy example of those different different shaped keys. It's a neat thing to see for us Americans to remember that there are lots of different languages, different character sets, even in just simple Romance languages like Portuguese. All right, time for the pros and cons. So the pros for us, as somebody with a degree in international relations, I love the interesting international history of this machine how it was first developed in Switzerland, how it moved to Germany, and how it ultimately came to rest as a simplified, cheaper, but still okay, machine in South America. It's a story of globalism in many ways. I like the Portuguese character set. I like having something different. You don't see these very often around here, while you still have the QWERTY layout. And it's not QWERTY, what you see in German and other things. Uh, it's just fun to have, and it doesn't cost you anything really other than the loss of a half or a character fraction, which nobody uses anymore anyway. Also, you lose your at, so writing emails may be a little bit tougher <laughs> with this one. 
And overall, I like a lightweight typewriter. This is something you could easily slip into a messenger bag. It's very thin, it's very flat. It's what made the Hermes Baby at the beginning so popular, uh, is that it has this ultra portability. And you always give up something for that. And that's what leads us into the cons. So Kevin, name us off some of the cons. So it has a very brittle plastic design. That's right, so we talked about that already. Ours, and probably all of them, and again, ours isn't the only example, have these cracks wherever there are any kind of pressure points um, from the supporting infrastructure um, the cracks have happened ours is split right down the middle underneath and that's no fun and we just popped it off there we go we popped off our back piece we'll have to secure that down some more put that down as a con but uh, what's next kevin so it's really a simplified design that's right so an example of that might be the fact we don't have our baby sweater or any sound dampening like we have in the hermes baby we just have plastic and that's all you got what's next well it its property it has proprietary spools just like you were trying to say there proprietary soda. now you can yeah you know, it's proprietary sorta of, because they have these and i'll zoom in for you you have these very large spindles, even larger than a DIN uh, 2103, which you use on the German machines. Um, and there is an expanding clip, not unlike some of the late model Smith Coronas had, that hold the ribbon uh, spindle in place, ribbon spool. So I have seen the universal spindle, which will fit this, supposedly, but I don't have any. But if I had one of these Volterra 82s laying around, I would make sure I didn't lose these Olivetti spindles because uh, they work and uh, they're guaranteed to. So uh, that's another con. I don't like having to have a proprietary spool for any typewriter. And I'm looking at you every single Remington I've ever looked at. Okay, what's the next uh, next one, Kevin? Um, the catch is okay, but it's not really great. That's right. So we, we talked about typing on this machine. We showed you typing on this machine, and it's okay. Um, we could have done with a better ribbon, I think. But it's very similar to a Smith Corona Corsair, which is a much more common machine, and I think that'll give you a sense of that. If you like a Corsair, you're, you'll know exactly what you're getting here. If you hate the Corsair, well, you better stay away from the Latera 82 unless you speak Portuguese. All right, in summary, if, like Dr. Jones, you are into building a museum of typewriters from antiquity, the Latera 82 deserves a place in your inventory, and that's due to its unique international history and its neat Portuguese keyboard. But if you're not into ancient historical artifacts, you're not a typewriter archeologist, you'd probably be better off just getting a brother. In other words, it belongs in a museum. It belongs in a museum. Please like, subscribe, and share.